Today we're going to continue on our sermon series called The Way of the World Changer. You guys ready for this? Everybody say The Way of the World Changer. That's my way. No, speak it over yourself. I'm not saying me. Like, yeah, that's my way. Yeah. <laughs> that's our way. That's our way. That's, that's, that's how we're living around here at Legacy Nashville. This is our culture. This is uh, our principles. This is our DNA. And so what we've done is we have selected five words that start with the letter H. At this point, you probably have them tattooed on you. Uh, gang tats, anybody? I'll do it. I will do it. <laughs> yeah, I, it's int- I can also get you guys to get tattooed more than I can get you guys to sign up for Legacy College. But by the end of this message, the whole room is going to be attending. Uh, the five H's, uh, the first one is this. It is holy. You guys remember that? Number two is? Number two is humble. Uh, Number three is hungry, which we talked about last week. Uh, I shared a message called A Theology for Hard Work. And I was not prepared for how prophetic that was going to be this week. I actually thought at the end of the first message, I told Grace downstairs, I was like, I don't think that was good. Like, I feel like I was scatterbrained and all over the place, but I know it's what God told me to say. And then the second service, um, you know, she gave me a prophetic word during the worship and I felt encouraged and then this week is just as I watched socials I was like no actually that was a word from the Lord I know that it was you know and so this week we're going to endeavor to tackle the fourth H which is honorable everybody say honorable look at your neighbor say I honor you that's a good thing to say I honor you and then that fifth H which my wife is going to cover next week she's going to be preaching Pastor Allison My beloved bride, she's going to be talking about healthy, all right? So I want you guys to be here next week for hers, healthy. Also next week in the evening, we're going to be having Encounter Night, which is going to be in collaboration with Lindy Conant and the Circuit Riders. So if you need an excuse to come to Encounter Night next Sunday night, I can promise you it will be lit for sure. It's going to be so good. So today we're going to cover honorable, that fourth H. And the way that we talk about honor here as a leadership team is is like this. We are honorable towards everyone, every single person. We want to be honorable towards every person. No one is, air quotes, normal. Everyone is a treasure whom God enjoys and adores. We prefer one another no matter the cost. And then the last thing we say is this, how we talk to one another matters. Everyone can expect honest and graceful communication. And to be certain, gossip is never not dishonor. Let me say that again. Gossip is never not dishonor. When we gossip about each other, we bring division, which is exactly what the enemy wants and never what God wants. And gossip is one of the ways that the enemy divides the family of God, the church. You know, devil, the word devil in the Greek is diablos, which means to divide. And the enemy works very, very hard. I mean, we can see it all over the world to bring division to people, especially to the church, to the people of God, uh, to get us pitted against one another. And one of the common tools that hell uses to divide the church is gossip. And so we say all the time here, hey, gossip is a fireable offense. It's just not something that we're willing to tolerate. We celebrate honor. We want to honor each other. So that's what I want to talk about today. Biblically, when you look at the word or the term honor or honorable, uh, we see that it kind of has a bit of a double definition. I like to say it like this. Honor in the Bible is both vertical and it's horizontal, kind of like the cross. All right, so honor is both vertical and horizontal. What do I mean by that? It's kind of like righteousness or the term justice in the Bible. It is both vertical and it is horizontal, meaning it has to do with our relationship to God, but it also has, a, has to do with our relationship with other people. All right, same as righteousness. 
honor, we, we honor God and we honor his creation. Somebody say amen. amen. That's what we're called to do biblically uh, given our definition of honor. Simply put, honor in the Bible means a great respect. Everybody say respect. That's a simple definition. Simply put, honor means to respect. We, we respect, we honor, we revere God. We respect, we honor, we bless, we cherish his creation, other people. We honor. So let's talk a little bit about the vertical relationship that we have with God of honor to start. Vertically, we and all of creation, that means nature, that means animals, we're called to honor, we're called to respect, and we're called to revere God as creator. So vertically, we're all called to honor God. Let's look at Psalm 50, verse 14 and 15. It says this, Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Some of you guys know what that feels like this morning. You did not want to roll out of bed and come to church. But this morning, Sunday at 9 a.m., you offered unto the Lord a sacrifice of praise. <laughs> it was raining a little bit. You didn't feel like driving to church. But you honored the Lord by coming to his house and giving him a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And pay your vows to the Most High, the Bible says. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you. Man, that's good news right there, isn't it, church? And get this. And you will honor me. Everybody say vertical. This is vertical honor. And you will honor God who rescues you. Now, this word here, honor, is a word we're actually quite familiar with, believe it or not. It is the word kabod. Anybody want to uh, learn some Hebrew this morning? Everybody say kabod. kabod. What does that mean? It means glory. Right? Glory. Glory, the word kabod, actually means heavy or weighty. That's why I always warn people when they're asking God to see the glory. Are you ready to carry the weight of God's glory? Because if you're not willing to put in the work to hone in his character, that glory may crush you. Be careful what you ask for, right? But so the psalmist here is telling us that we are called to vertically honor God. What does that mean? By giving glory to God. That's essentially what it means, to give glory to God. That means to place a heavy, remember kabod means heavy or weighty. That means to that means to place a heavy value on God, right? So that means to put weight, put stock in your connection with God. That's what it looks like to respect God vertically. That's what it looks like to honor God and give him glory is to put weight on him. No, I'm giving weight to this relationship. This relationship matters in my life. This connection is sacred to me. It matters to me. I'm putting weight on this relationship. So I'll say no to other things because I'm trying to honor God. I'm trying to bring glory to God. I'll say no to going out because I've got a date with God in the prayer closet. I'll say no to hanging out till 3 a.m. on Saturday night because I've got to be at church on Sunday morning morning at 9 a.m. I'm trying to honor God vertically. You guys know what I'm talking about. If you're a leader in here, listen, your Sunday morning starts on Saturday night. <laughs> if you've got to welcome people at the door, please don't stay out till 5 a.m. <laughs> I'd like to be greeted by a happy person, not a tired person. We're all going to church. Glad you're here. We'd like to have a better sacrifice of thanksgiving than that. Amen? So we place a heavy value on God. It's a big respect. And you see uh, Psalm chapter 8, verse 5. This is a prophetic word from King David. He is writing about the Messiah whom we know is, everybody say Jesus. Right? Psalm 8 and 5 says this. You made him a little lower than the angels because he, you know, he's robed in flesh. And get this. You've crowned him. So see the picture. A crown, right? You've crowned him with what? With glory and what? Honor. You've, so we're talking about honor today. We just mentioned that glory and honor, they're synonymous terms. They mean weight. They mean heavy, right? And so what is it that David is writing 
uh, that the Messiah will one day fulfill is that God, the creator, that vertical honor we have for him, he's actually going to honor his son who is going to come as the Messiah and he is going to be crowned by the father with the weight of glory and with the heaviness of the honor of heaven. Now, that's a very powerful picture. In fact, whenever Paul writes about Jesus as the Messiah a little bit later, Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 2, verse 7. It is. 2, 7, Paul verbatim, copy, paste, Psalm 2 and 8 in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7, and he said, Jesus was crowned with glory and with honor. And then Paul's also making a reference to us as we receive the inheritance that Jesus paid for through the cross. That the Father, the one that we honor vertically, will honor us as Christians by crowning us with a weight of glory and with a heavy honor. So whether or not you were aware of this, if you are a born-again believer, God the Father chooses to honor you and place upon you a crown and adorn you and speak words of life over you and bring weight upon you and declare you are important and adorn you with honor. Man, that's got to feel good. Somebody say, that feels good. That the Father honors you. Woo! That does feel good, doesn't it? To know that you are loved and you are honored by God. And so honoring God is giving glory to God vertically. And you can think of it like this. Uh, Use that picture that, that David used, that Paul later used, which is of crowning. So like when you think about your vertical relationship with God, whenever you honor God, here's what you do. You take a crown, you put it on his head. So today when we were up here in the altar or you're in the back, wherever you were standing and you were lifting your hands and you were singing your praise, your offering of thanksgiving to the Lord, what were you doing? We honor you, Jesus. We adorn you with glory. Here's here's a weighty crown. This one cost me something. When my friends made fun of me for being a Christian, oh, that hurt. This one cost me something, but I'm going to give you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. Why? Because you have weight in my world. You are worthy to wear the crown of glory in my life. This is why you see, even in the book of Revelation, the, the, the elders, they start taking the crowns off. What's the crown? It's glory. It's honor. It's that honor that God has put on us as his kids. And we're saying... Just slinging him right to his feet. No, only you are worthy. Only you are worth this. Only you carry this weight. You receive the glory. You receive the honor. That's honor. That's vertical honor. That's good, isn't it? I used to practice this when I'd go out to do like itinerant speaking and stuff. And you know, whenever people compliment you, which is always so nice, they say, man, good message. That was awesome. Way to go. You know, and I would, I would always practice this. Go back to my hotel room and I'd say, man, Jesus, thank you for the honor. Thank you for the folks that were kind to me and said nice things to me. I'm not the one worthy to wear that glory. I'm not the one worthy to wear that honor. But this belongs to you, Jesus. This is yours. I honor you. I honor you vertically. And God wants to be honored. And in fact, if you're going to walk with God, he's going to require that you honor him. And here are some ways that we can honor God vertically. Number one is by worshiping him. Number two is by obeying him. I'm not giving you all the scripture for this because it would slow it down. I really want to talk about horizontal honor. Uh, We honor God with our bodies. We honor God with our money and our possessions. We honor God by caring for other people. These are ways that we honor God. God vertically, and and God is actually quite serious about us bringing honor to him. Look at Numbers chapter 20, verse uh, 12. Uh, The Bible says, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to, everybody say honor, honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I give them. Dishonor actually kept Moses and Aaron out of their promised land. 
Dishonoring God kept them out of their promise. Honor is very important to God. God wants to be honored in your life. God wants to receive a weighty, it's you, it's you. I honor you. It's not me. I didn't get the break. You brought the breakthrough, Lord. It's only by your grace. It's not in my strength. It's not in my power. But by your spirit, Lord. You see what I'm saying? And that's also, I think that links uh, pretty good to humility. But now let's talk about that, that horizontal honor, meaning we as human beings made in the very image of God are also called to honor and to respect one another. Now in the Bible, if you're studying honor, uh, the first horizontal relationship that you're supposed to honor is your parents. And I, I know that's going to hurt our feelings a little bit. But notice that, that God did not ask you uh, to consult with your experience with your parents before he required you to honor them. And I, I, listen, I know some of us have grown up in some very, very terrible, uh, we've had very terrible home lives. Listen, even if you have a good parent, not everything was perfect. But God said, listen, despite any of the sin that has come against you as a result of a bad connection with the parent, my word says I require you to honor them. And by listening to me and not consulting with your experience alone, I will honor you and I'll bring you long life if you'll obey me. Because God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not interested in hitting reset every time a new kid is born. He wants to carry out a spiritual inheritance so that there will be no end to his government. And he would extend that government through us, not just as spiritual moms and dads with spiritual sons and daughters, but with natural moms and dads and natural sons and daughters. And I'm craving that. I expect to see that through Legacy Nashville, that the kids that Seth and Michelle are raising up, that they would want to be in God's house, that they would be passionate about God's word, that they would be zealous about God's truth, that they would be hungry to have an encounter with God's spirit, and that they would be able to remain and then teach the next generation of kids. I believe that's what God wants. He wants to see honor generationally. Therefore, he includes in the Ten Commandments, which are still relevant. Can somebody say amen? amen. Which are still relevant. Amen. Right? He said, listen, I want you to honor your parents. And if you do, there'll be life attached to it. Now, and then he says in his word as well, you've got to honor other people. Uh, you especially need to honor other believers. That's something that the Word teaches us. You look at Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. It says, let love be genuine. Stop faking it. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with what? A brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing. Come on, y'all help me preach this, 9 a.m. Outdo one another in showing. Well, I honor them. We haven't shown them. Honor looks like something. It's not just hiding it in your heart. Well, I really honor that person. Have you told them? Have you done something for them? Have you given them a sacrifice of thanksgiving? Have you honored them? Right? And, and, and so we see here in Romans, this is Paul. He, see, he said, I want you to, if you want to compete in something, don't compete in Instagram followers. Compete in showing each other honor. <laughs> who can be the most honorable towards people who don't deserve it? This is, this is horizontal honor. And so in the Old Testament, we talked about kabod, right? The heavy, the weighty, the glory, the honor. But in the New, Test, uh, New Testament, uh, it's, a, it's a Greek word that's written like time with the, one of those little like fancy apostrophe things. Uh, but it's, it, it sounds like this, time. Everybody say time. Yeah. We learned some Hebrew, now we're getting some Greek, all right? It, it, it's the word time. And I really like this definition. It actually means to perceive the right value. Now, everybody say this with me. To perceive, perceive. the right value. Right. That's what time means in the Greek. And so whenever God tells us, hey, I want you to honor your friend, honor your neighbor, it means this. I perceive their value rightly. Wow. Yeah. It's very interesting, right? Time. So uh, when Paul says that Jesus has received glory and honor, he uses the term doxa. Everybody use doxa. The Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word kabod, which means weighty, and then time, which means ornamentation. Isn't that interesting? Like when I honor you, I, 
I dress you up in glory. Isn't that good? Here's a weight. Here's some new gear. You look good. I honor you. This is how we beautify the bride, by, by honor. I honor you. Ornamentation is actually what the word means. And perceiving the right value. And so you can imagine that picture, dressing someone up in the spirit when you honor them in the natural. To honor them is to place a crown on their head, to adorn them, to communicate their appropriate value and their worth. And notice you're not looking at culture to appropriate value. You're looking to the Father as you honor Him vertically. You're better able to honor people horizontally by seeing what God sees, knowing that their value is so much greater than anything anybody could put upon them. And so you start dressing them up in accordance to the, to the Father's word over their life and not your perspective in the natural. Come on, I think this is better than some of you guys are saying amen. I think this is going to help us. And, and this is one of the reasons why we're just never done worshiping Jesus. We just always honor, more honor, more honor. Because he's so worthy of it, we'll be doing it forever. But, you know, we're not always the best at perceiving value, are we? If, if you look at, you know, the Greek word, outdo one another in showing honor. And that's the word time, uh, which means to perceive the right value. I think it's safe to say that we're not always the best at perceiving the right value. You know what I'm saying? Like you see somebody and you're like, how valuable are they? Now, we don't say it like that out loud because that would be embarrassing. But in reality, how often are we sizing people up in our hearts, determining their value on how much honor we're going to choose to give them? Well, how much, does, how much honor does this person deserve? How much honor does that person deserve? Well, not that much. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And we do this incessantly, but we don't always acknowledge it. Now, you know, what's it worth, right? It's, it's kind of what teammate means in the Greek, you know, to perceive the right value. And when I, it, it made me think, I was reflecting this week, and I, I know that like basketball cards have gotten popular again. Have you guys noticed that? And I, I, Ray, I know, collects basketball cards. And, you know, I'm praying for a, a Steph Curry rookie that he would uncover one of those in Jesus' name and then feel to honor his pastor with that. And um, <laughs> just kidding, Ray. I'm just kidding. Greatest shooter of all time, amen. We bless him in Jesus' name. We got a game at 3.30. <laughs> hey, look, don't get mad at me. I lead his uh, intercession uh, team. <laughs> Sanctioned by the Father, amen. Amen. Um, Amen. So when I was a kid, you know, we would always, uh, we'd always trade basketball cards. Did you guys ever do that when you were a kid? I used to have these books, you know, the sleeves. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And I'd have all these basketball cards in there. And I actually collected two books filled with Michael Jordan cards. So I used to collect Michael Jordan cards, who is, by the way, the undisputed goat. I mean, just in case, if anybody was wondering. Uh, the undisputed goat is Michael Jordan. And so I used to collect all these cards uh, of Michael Jordan, and I was so excited. You know, I'd always trade cards with my friends. And when we'd sit down to trade cards, what would be the one question that would move quickly across the table? What's it worth? Right? Well, how much is that card worth? That's what you would ask, right, before you would trade. And I don't know if you guys remember this or not, but they actually had these things called Beckett's. Anybody? Okay, we were the only nerds. It's, this illustration's really for me and Ray. I mean, you guys are just here today, okay? And so we, we would get these Becketts, and you'd open up the Beckett, and you'd go through, and you'd, oh, that's an upper deck. Oh, that's a Fleer. Oh, that's 1989. That's card number 515, and it's worth $18. So then you would trade. I know the kids today, they're into, like, Pokemon cards and things, and I know they've made a comeback, you know. But we were always asking this question, what's it worth? What's it worth? What's it worth? And my dad used to get on my last nerve whenever I, and Spencer will remember this, when I'd say, Dad, I got this card. You know what it's worth? He'd be like, what's it worth? A thousand dollars, baby. 
And you know what he would always say, Spence? Let's sell it. Yeah. <laughs> sell it? Are you serious, Dad? I'm not going to sell this card. You know how much this card's going to be worth in the future if I hold on to it and I keep it in mint condition? Yeah. And, and he used to say this thing to me. Man, it used to get on my last nerve. It was always this, son... The value of anything is determined by what somebody's willing to pay for it. That's what he'd always tell me. Man, it always got on my nerve. Something is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. Now, that is not what you want to hear when you're trading cards, right? And so you may say that your card, okay, it's worth this much, but unless somebody is willing to pay that much, it doesn't matter what the Beckett says because it's not actually worth that much. That's nice to say that your card is worth $1,000, but if you can't get anybody to pay any more than 10, it's not actually worth 1,000. Something is only worth, right, what someone is willing to pay for it. All right, now that, obviously that's incredibly bothersome, but I, I, I brought this card. You guys see this right here? This is a Michael Jordan card, and I have honored it by putting it in a, cl a, a plastic case. Right? I, I could have just, I just, just crumbled it up and put it in my pocket. But no, no, I didn't. I, I honored it, actually. Yeah. Didn't I? So I, I framed it up in this case here. And I said, this card has value. This card has honor. This is a, um, a game-dated card. And uh, I can't remember what year this is. Let's see. It's a 1997 Upper Deck Michael Jordan card. And you know who gave me this card? Pastor Bruce Mason. He was here a couple of, uh, of, of uh, weeks ago when he was my youth pastor. All right? And so, like, uh, I had done something for him. I don't know. I was probably helping him, like, pick up his yard or something. Probably very lazily as well. And, uh, and he was like, here you go. You can have this card. It was in this case and everything. He was like, that's a Michael Jordan game-dated 97th upper deck. I mean, he was really honoring this card. I was like, man. How much it worth? <laughs> you know, he said, he said $500. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Took it home, opened up that Beckett, found it. Boom, $500. I was like, this thing is worth 500 bucks. Hey, Dad, <laughs> look what Bruce gave me. Most valuable card in my collection. It is worth $500, Dad. You know what he said? Sell it. Yeah. That, I'm not going to sell it. It's worth $500. If it's worth $500 now, it's going to be worth so much. Better. He said, son, listen, you need to remember, something is only worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. Yeah. Right? That's what he said. Something's only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. And so, you know, you know what I did, guys, this week? I found this. I actually, this card, I have it in my office, right? And I've always held on to it. I've honored this card, right? And so I decided, well, I'm going to be, this sermon made me think of this, like perceiving the right value. And I was like, I'm going to look that up. Guess how much it's worth today? Five dollars. <laughs> Don't start that, Seth. <laughs> I don't know if it's quite worthy of all this honor that I've given it. A little screw there and all that. But my dad's words rang in my ears. Son, something is only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. And I was like, man, God, I always hated hearing that. And so, you know, here's what I realized is I thought my card was worth way more than what it actually is. So what did I do? I overvalued the card to my point. We're not always that good at perceiving the right value, yeah. right? We're not always good at perceiving the right value. Uh, and this happens the other way too. We can really undervalue things as well. And sometimes it's really hard to tell how much something is worth. Consider Nashville real estate, for instance. You're like, you want me to pay half a million dollars for that? My God. Nah, I think I'm good, actually, you know. And, uh, and I actually, I, so I had a slide. I actually looked up uh, some of the most expensive shoes. Check these out right here. These are the Nike Mag Back to the Futures, size 7 from 2016. Look at this. 
Somebody has valued this shoe at $100,000. They're asking $100,000. You guys, did you guys ever see Back to the Future? That's the Marty McFly's right there. All right. And so, but I also noticed this, huh? The highest bid is $40,000. And then there's Jeff Phillips. Son, something is only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. So I don't know who this guy is selling this shoe for $100,000, but it obviously is not worth that. What it's worth at this point is $40,000, right? So I'm like, okay, Lord, what are you trying to teach me uh, through this? You know, and I, I just felt like that, you know, I just, I kept hearing my dad and I'm like, okay, all right, yeah, uh, that, that makes sense. And then I started thinking about going to my Meemaw's house as a kid. And you know her favorite show, The Price is Right. <laughs> and I was like, man, why is this show entertaining? Because we're actually really terrible at perceiving the right value. What's this kitchen at worth? $14,000, Bob. And they're like, nope, it was 2000 You know, it's like, and it's, and it's entertaining, right? Because we classically are just not that good at perceiving the right value. So something is only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it, right? And so when you think about honor, the topic of honor, honor flows from valuing another person rightly. The only way that I'm ever really able to honor you well is to perceive your value rightly. Because if I misperceive your value, I'll actually honor you inappropriately. So what, what commonly happens? What commonly happens is I'll either overvalue somebody because I believe that they are in a position to bless me. Right? So my honor is not actually honor. It's actually manipulation. And so I'm like, oh, let me honor you. Let me help you. Let me help. Oh, I'm, I'm just trying to honor the man of God. I'm just trying to honor this super rich person. I'm just trying to honor this very famous person. I'm just trying to honor this person who actually, if they took me under their wing, you know, my stuff could get bigger. My stuff could grow. I could make more money, right? But no, I'm just trying to honor them, right? We'll totally spiritualize our language. But in actuality, what we've done is we've overvalued them. And most often we've undervalued ourselves. But then how often do we undervalue somebody else, right? Right? This is, remember, this is outdo one another in showing honor, perceive other people's value appropriately, and then honor them as such, right? We'll undervalue other people, and we'll kind of look over their head. Right? You guys know what I'm talking about. This is Nashville. Like you're at some type of a mixer. Maybe it's business, ministry, personal, and you've turned into networking Ned, and you're like, cool, man. Face pump. <laughs> you gotta, you're looking for the most important person. You guys know what I'm talking about? We're undervaluing people. And honestly, we don't just do this to other people. We do it to ourselves. There's a lot of people who undervalue themselves. Therefore, when other people mistreat us, we'll look at it and say, well, you know, I guess that's just the way the cookie crumbles because I'm not really that valuable. So no wonder they treated me as a doormat. And then on the other hand, we have people who overvalue themselves and they truly believe they're the most important person that steps into every room they ever step into. And they overvalue themselves. What they're doing is they're not doing what Paul taught us to do, outdoing one another by showing honor and perceiving the right value and then honoring people because they carry that value. So we make this mistake often and I'm realizing that we're just not that good at perceiving honor, kind of like me with my... Uh, value, kind of like me with my Michael Jordan card, because the world is a really big place. And instead of seeing stories, we see statistics, don't we? Instead of seeing people, we see crowds. It's really hard to value somebody that you have not had the opportunity to get up close and personal with. But remember what Paul said, let love be genuine. Don't fake it. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So what does that mean? 
mean? That means to honor someone then is to give weight to that person. It means to give respect to that person in your life. Usually, the way the world does honor is solely, strictly on the basis of position, status, or wealth. But we are called by God to move in a different spirit as believers because we honor other people despite position, in spite of status, and no matter how wealthy they are. This is what God does, therefore this is what we're called to do. God doesn't look at the external appearances, but God looks at the heart. So I want to talk to you here in the last, you know, eight, nine minutes, give you some points how to honor other people. Number one is this. See each and every person as an image bearer of God. If you can truly work to surrender yourself, your heart, your mind, your spirit, and say, Lord, show me, show me the image. Let me see this person rightly. They look a little bit like you. I, I know that, that it's kind of like that leaves us dumbfounded a little bit. But the truth is every single human being that you meet looks a little bit like him. So my question to you this morning, church, is when you look at other people, do you see him? Can you see him? Are you willing to see him? Or are you only seeing the dirt that they're covered in? Or are you only seeing the anger that's coming out of their mouth? Or are you only feeling and sensing the disrespect and the dishonor that they show you? Are you able to look past all of that and recognize that this person, despite our disagreements, this person, despite the fact they may even be my enemy, come on, let's go gospel of Jesus, they are deserving of honor, they're deserving of dignity, they're deserving of weight, they're deserving of love. Why? Because they're an image bearer and God created them in his own image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Yeah. Right? So everybody looks a little bit like him. Just, you know, look at the person next to you real quick, real quick. Do you see him? Man, for those of you who are married, I just blessed you. Or potentially caused a fight on the way home. I don't know. But this would do us well, even as married people. This would do us well as parents. There are times we need to look at our, parent, our kids and say, do I see him? My God, I, I see a demon. <laughs> right? But we, we need to upgrade in our perspective. Why? Because that little one was created in the likeness of God. Do you see him? This is, this is very important. And, and, and you don't see people as opportunities. You don't see people as commodities. If you're in ministry, you don't see people as testimonies. Number two, give weight to everybody despite or in spite of their position, their status, or their wealth. And I have a, I have a book to read you right here, all right? I'm going to read from James 2. I'm going to read verse 1 through 9 because it was so good. There's just no reason for me to add anything to it, okay? Here it goes. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the Lord of honor, right? So, for if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your church and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and you say, hey, you, sit here in this good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored. You've dishonored the poor man. Are the rich, are, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Now, he's not talking about rich believers, uh, but it, it could potentially be. But in this case, he's talking about um, the Romans, the occupation. Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. I have nothing to add to that. Is that good? That's good. That's good. But if you, do we have another one? But if you show partiality, oh, save the best for last. <laughs> you know I like those punchy scriptures. Uh, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. What law? It's the law of love. 
You are transgressors. This is, this is powerful. Uh, point three, intentionally honor those that are easy to take for granted. Parents, spouses, kids, elders, and leaders. These are the easiest people to take for granted. You know why? Because you're around them all the time. So you know what? You see all of their flaws. You see something that social media can't show you, which is that they are humans, they are normal, and they also sin. Just like you. Intentionally honor those that you take for granted. Parents, spouses, kids, elders, and leaders. Let's go to parents real quick. I'm just give you a scripture for each one. Parents, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Exodus 20 and 12. Next one. Oh, spouses. Sorry. They look the exact same. The slides are just too good, Grace. Let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she honors the husband. You know, we could just read the Bible and we'd, we'd be so not politically correct that we'd all get canceled. <laughs> I, I love it so much, actually. Uh, kids, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. All the parents in here say amen, please. Amen. Come on, all the parents say amen. 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 See that none of you despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels... Always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. That's a powerful, powerful thing. Last thing. Oh, my bad. Elders, then leaders. You sh I'm, I'm all kind of confused right now. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord. Be careful how you treat elderly people. They're not disposable. They're important. They're sacred. They're sacred to God. They're image bearers. Leaders, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And I did not include that to try to, like, get you to do anything. But thanks for the Steph Curry card. Um, <laughs> but it's in the Bible, and I wanted to read it just because it is there. It is God's truth. And I don't want to shrink back from declaring what God says is true, despite the fact that I might be sharing it. It's what he asked. Point four, adorn others with words of honor, dignity, and respect. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 says, Let no corrupting talk, that's gossip, um, aggrandizement, tearing people down. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for the building up. You remember the picture that I gave you in the beginning? Dressing them up, ornamentation, adorning, putting the crown on. The very opposite of that, tearing them down, destroying them with your words. But no, this is what we do. We, we adorn other people with our words. Man, let's place a crown on their head. They may not deserve it, but you know what? Jesus paid for it so they could wear it. You know what? They may be looking miserable right now, but they just need a new set of clothes. Let me try to adorn them a little bit. And, and I can tell you guys, this works. You know, when you honor people that don't deserve it, their attitude changes. It's true. I've done it on countless occasions with a cashier. Bad mood, super mean. Man, how can I honor this guy right here? The other day I was doing one of those Kroger click list things. And, and you know, he was, oh, he was mad. He was just in a bad mood. He was just sour. And I said, hey, can I get out and help you? And I could tell it just shocked him that I even asked. And he goes, you know what? Go ahead and get out. And I'm like, is this guy going to fight me or help me get the groceries? And then he just unloaded on me. You know how many people talk mean to me? You know how many people act like just they're arrogant? They, act, they treat me like I'm some kind of servant. I said, man, I'm so sorry to hear that. And, um, you know, we just sat there for a little bit. I just, I don't even remember what I said to him, but just looking for little moments to honor him. And, and by the end of it, he shook my hand. And I was like, man, hey, I'm a pastor. I, you should come to our church. <laughs> and he was like, oh, I'm a Christian. And then we got to talk about God. Adorning others with words of honor, dignity, and respect, it changes their atmosphere. It changes the trajectory of their day. You never know it might change the trajectory of their week, of their month, of their life, of knowing, look, you, ha you have dignity. You look a little bit like him. You're not behaving like him, but you look enough like him. 
You're deserving of honor and blessing. Everyone is deserving of honor. At the end of the day, this is the, the final uh, you know, point of the message before we pray. At the end of the day, church, everybody is deserving of honor. You know why? Because Jesus died for them. Every single person, no matter who it is, loved one or enemy, is deserving of honor. Why? Because Jesus Christ died for them. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Right? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I think it's 12, 2. Nope, 5, 8. Romans 5, 8. For even when we were sinners, Jesus died for us. And I know it might seem that that person, they're not worthy of honor. They have a low value. That person, they're not worthy of any respect. There's no weight in my life. And yet Jesus says, no, they have weight in my life. They're worthy of respect in my world. They're worthy of honor in my life. How do we know that? Because he gave his life for them. And the price that Jesus paid on the cross determined the value of the people that he purchased. The price that Jesus paid on the cross determined the value of the people that he purchased. So when you look at the person that you're struggling to honor, the person that you're struggling with respecting, when you're looking for somebody that you'd like to point God's truth and honor them, let me ask you a quick question. What are they worth? What's it worth? Ask them. What are they worth? And then, you remember this? Something is only worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. What did Jesus pay for? How much did Jesus pay for? Somebody is only worth what Jesus was willing to pay for it. So what did he pay? That's how much honor they're worthy of. Let's stand up. Let's pray. Lord, everybody is worthy of honor. Everybody is worthy of respect. Lord, we seek to honor you vertically today. We want to honor you with our praise, with our worship. But Lord, we also want to honor our brothers and our sisters. We want to honor our family and our friends. We want to honor our parents and our elders. We want to honor leaders in our life, people that you've given authority to in our hearts, Lord. We want to honor, we want to be people who do what Paul said, which is to outdo one another in showing honor. May we take this as a personal mission statement as Legacy Nashville, that we're going to be a church, we're going to be a family that seeks to outdo one another in showing honor. Let us rush to the bottom in serving. Let us rush to the bottom in dignifying. Let us rush to the bottom in complimenting and speaking life over people and showing respect to people. And even, even in the area of giving up seats or uh, parking spaces here at church or serving somebody, even if that's not your responsibility that day or complimenting people or using good manners and saying, yes, please, thank you, yes, sir, no, sir. Just let us honor people to the very best of our ability. Every avenue that we have to honor, Lord, we say yes to doing so. Help us honor our wives. Uh, help us honor, uh, your, if you're a lady, you're married, you help us honor our husbands. Help us to show the honor that Jesus has showed to each and every one of us through the cross. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen and amen and amen. Come on, can we just give the Lord a big hand clap of praise as we're closing? We love you so much. Be blessed, Legacy. Be blessed.